Hi, and welcome to Ethnographic Imagination Basel, a series on reimagining the world from the mundane. My name is George Pomeu, and uh, this episode will be on birthing, that is, uh, the process of giving birth. Our guest is Stefano Kumu Ambere, um, who has researched birth in relation to medicalization, uh, social assistance programs, and motherhood. So stay tuned for a conversation on how birthing can help us reimagine the world. Stefano Kumu Ombere is lecturer of anthropology at Maseno University in Kisumu, Kenya, and postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Advancement of Scholarships at the University of Pretoria on a project called Reimagining Reproduction. He is author of two monographs, The Sociocultural Context of Circumcised Men's Sexual Behavior in Kenya, published in 2015, and Local Perceptions of Social Protection Schemes in Maternal Health in Coastal Kenya, defended as a PhD dissertation at the University of Bern in 2018. Stefan has also authored and co-authored articles applying a medical anthropological perspective to a wide variety of topics, including circumcision, HIV AIDS, maternal health, and children's vulnerability to sexual abuse. Stefan, a hearty welcome to Ethnographic Imagination Basel. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. You have done extensive research on the rise um, in the last decade or so of social assistance or social protection uh, programs that attend mostly to women who are uh, poor uh, and to their birth giving practices. You start one of your studies noting just how urgent these programs appear to be. About 830,000 women die from either pregnancy or childbirth related complications every day around the world. And birthing appears, um, as you put it, um, uh, to affect specifically poorer women. Um, um, they are more at risk. So how did you come to birthing and to maternal health? And why are these phenomena um, important? both in Kenya and in the wider global context today? Um, thank you so much, George. Um, when you talk about social protection in maternal health, eh, I know it's a global issue. Um, the main reason why I settled on um, social protection uh, in maternal health in Kenya is that we had a project that really wanted to investigate uh, the perception of the community about government initiative to try to lower maternal health issues and maternal death in Kilifi County. Oh, we find that in Kilifi County, we have uh, the highest percentage of maternal mortality. And uh, because uh, maternal health issues are global agenda, you find that uh, Government of Kenya received a lot of funding from the donors, but now we wanted to know how do community perceive these programs? Do, do they really speak to their needs or is it the government initiative minus people's uh, most felt needs? So being a young anthropologist, I was approached by uh, this multidisciplinary project in Maseno and I found myself uh, in this project. And I spent quite some time in Kilifi, around nine months, uh, doing ethnographic fieldwork uh, in maternal health issues. Yes, it's very important because we know uh, maternal health, uh, as I said, is a global agenda. And um, the global community is really campaigning to, to try and reduce uh, maternal mortality, especially in Africa. And the thing is, as much as there is this campaign, but now... What about the most vulnerable? How do they perceive these programs? Do these programs reach them? So the, the main reason why I settled on the, the most vulnerable is when you look at the, 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 the statistics and the magnitude of maternal death, you find that uh, the most vulnerable, these are the people, the women who, in terms of bargaining power, they have low bargaining power. So uh, as an anthropologist, I went out there to give them a voice to, to find out what do they say, and in terms of intervention, what do this mean to the government and the, the global community? Yeah. You brought up um, uh, Kilifi County, and I think we should tell our viewers mm -hmm. who are not familiar with Kenya that this is a coastal county. Um, oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And it's quite specific in the sense that it's it's both a place of tourism and intensified mobility and circulation, but also sharp inequalities. Yes. Uh, thank you, George, for, for that reminder. Yes, Kilifi County, as you said, is along the Kenyan coast and attracts uh, a lot of tourism activities. But again, if you look at um, the inequality uh, perspective of it, you find that there is a lot of inequality in Kilifi County. And this these populations are really affected by um, maternal health issues, issues of access to services. When there are calamities like drought, this county is mostly affected. Despite the fact that they have good attraction to tourism, the community rarely benefit from this program. So we wonder what can we do as upcoming scholars to ensure that these people are given voice. Um, whatever is there, how do these people benefit from uh, these programs to, to actually curb this inequality gap? These are such an important set of questions, and I wondered, and I wanted also our viewers to learn more from you about how you actually went about doing this research. What did it uh, consist of? Um, but related to that topic, I was also wondering how gender figures uh, in in the study of birthing, uh, to name the obvious, we are now here, two men <laughs> discussing uh, birthing issues. So I wanted to know what challenges and limitations you might have faced and learned from, in a way, um, while while studying birth oh, oh George, uh, that's a very important um, uh, question uh, thank you so much uh, the, the thing is invading a space that is not a uh, man's space is mm -hmm. very difficult and when talking about bath bathing process you know it touches on sexualities and when you are in a community such as Kilif, which is patriarchal, then negotiating and uh, invading that space becomes problematic and very challenging to male researchers, male um, investigators to say. So personally, as a, a man, it became a very big challenge until... Actually, it took around three months to for the community to accept me to study mm. women. And I relied mainly on a female research assistant to help me, um, introduce me to the community, help me negotiate um, women's space. But again, um, this female research assistant was very important because uh, she was able to um, talk about sensitive issues with women. The main challenge that comes with this is that there is a uh, likelihood of misinterpretation. There is likelihood of um, seeing the, the normal things, just normal, but uh, because as a researcher, uh, we are trained to look at normal things beyond normality. Yeah. But again, here is a, a young lady from this community who is likely to take things normal. So I find it, it was a bit difficult again to try to interpret what a um, research assistant gets from the women. But at some point also, I, I must admit that it was difficult. And at some point, it it was very difficult to get information from women. You know, men feeling uh, insecure, a man invading space of uh, women. But again, I'm happy because as anthropologists, we are trained to how to invade the space that... Um, um, are a bit invadable. There are skills that we, we are imparted with to negotiate, uh, to help us negotiate these spaces and um, get information that uh, ordinary people might not get. Uh, but it was very challenging. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I like I like your choice of the word invade because it does in a way underscore just how nosy we are sometimes oh, yeah. as anthropologists. <laughs> but, also, but also the importance of um, um, I mean, this is something also of a, of a, of a feminist incitement. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we look at the world, not just from the men's world, but learn from the perspective of women? And as you say, birthing probably in many uh, traditional quote-unquote mm -hmm. contexts mm -hmm. is a form of knowledge that's passed, it's very gendered and passed down mm -hmm. um, exclusively in these contexts. But at the same time, anthropologists are not alone. I'm, I'm wondering, but this, this, the social programs that you describe mm -hmm. um, and um, the kind of institutions working around it, they have already made birthing um, a, a, a form of knowledge that is not um, uh, exclusively a realm mm -hmm. um, of women. Uh, medical uh, personnel mm -hmm. um, probably can be of, of both genders or no. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, you know, that reminds me of uh, another important aspect, uh, medicalization of birth, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and when I talk of medicalization of birth, then to me, I see it as two competing narratives. So we have uh, the medical narrative and social narrative. In social narrative, we have folks taxonomies, how people refer to uh, different challenges women go through during birth. And also we have uh, the medical narrative where women, um, birth is seen as a health problem. And, and you know, it, it, it in a way shapes how women seek healthcare services when they are pregnant. Because, you know, it, uh, birth has been medicalized at, uh, right from postnatal. When you get pregnant, you're supposed to do A, B, C, D, according to yeah. medics. And people also have their own narrative. So you, we have two conflicting and competing narratives, social and medical narrative. And uh, this is also a, a bit challenging also. Yes. Yeah, I, you know th th that you bring up medicalization. It is not an obvious thing. Thinking as anthropologists now, mm. it is not an obvious thing that birth and birth giving should be medicalized. But, um, uh, and indeed now we see all kind of alternative sort of in many places, oh, alternative yeah. oh. ways of giving birth, alternative institutions where you can pursue a non-biomedicalized form of birth giving. Um, but birth is among the many domains, including sexuality, gender, mm. aging, mm. childhood, mm. that have been extended Mm. Um, medicalized. Mm. What do you think are some of the um, effects, some of the implications of this biomedicalization of birth uh, at the expense, one might say, um, at other kind of forms of attending to it, other cultural forms? Yes, uh, that is why I said these are two competing narratives. We have the, the medical narrative and social narrative. And in social narrative, uh, I'll again go back to Fox taxonomies because people have what they believe in. And these narratives um, give women alternatives on where to seek care. We cannot run away from the fact that despite the fact that uh, global uh, community is trying to deal with maternal mortality, we still have women who rely on um, local institutions like the traditional birth attendants to, to, to give birth. Um, and they really have trust in these traditional birth attendants. So it becomes um, a, a bit uh, problematic when, you know, uh, the government is campaigning that we have free maternal health care, please go to the health facility and deliver. And again, we have social narrative which says, okay, if you are expectant, then you are allowed to visit traditional birth attendant, especially the, 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 the very poor in the community who cannot even afford uh, transport to health facility. So... To me, I, I, I feel as much as uh, birth is being medicalized, the social narrative also still takes precedence, especially when you go to rural areas, um, hard to reach areas. Um, it's still there and it's something which is happening we cannot run away from. We have these social institutions which are very important. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And one wonders then also about the, the health risks that women themselves face in this day and age and how they might be different from previous. I mean, one of the questions I wanted to, to ask you was, well, anthropology has long been fascinated with birthing. Uh, one can easily claim that the process of giving birth everywhere, past and present, uh, has generated all kinds of anxieties, all kinds of fears, um, uh, fragility, um, uh, what have you? The, the from the I can think now of like the uh, some of the classic studies we've been reading from the very space how it's being secured with 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 spiritual protection from mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. first bath water to what you do with the placenta where mm -hmm. it must be how it must be disposed mm -hmm. what the meanings of that are are and so on. Um, it seems to me that that risk has always been there around mm -hmm. around birthing. Y yes, and uh, we cannot run away from the. Um, I'll call it uh, tocophobia. Tocophobia is uh, fear of giving birth. Mm -hmm. And fear of giving birth, um, to me, it has deep rooting in the community itself because, um, you know, people long to have children, yes, but when they, exp they see what their um, sisters, their relatives go through, and then, and here they are, they really want to have children, it becomes problematic because now they, they develop this fear and such kind of fear, you know, it, it has its own risks 
on 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 um these uh, women who are longing to have children you know they can have okay they can get pregnant they have stomach pains um they can have prolonged labors obstructed labors and uh in the long run if at all um these women come from the low socioeconomic background then Uh, the likelihood that maternal death or maternal complications may lead to diverse effects in the community uh, among these women are very high mm. but we have two classes here mm, tocophobia it, it regardless of class women uh, actually go through that fear of giving birth uh, but now it depends on uh, socio economic opportunities and background mm. we find that women from um Uh, I can I say I can say rich women you know they they know how to negotiate yeah, the system yeah. and where to go to um remedies you know when they go to hospital they ask please can you induce this pregnancy all those kind of things yeah. but for for the low socioeconomic uh, background then uh, women they they have um these complications and this is where maternal deaths are likely to occur Yes. So you're pointing to something very important here that class or if not class wealth disparity mm. really shapes uh, some of the risks involved here. So in a way that is one factor that makes what you're facing in in Kidifi but actually is is a global phenomenon mm-hmm. um somehow distinct uh, uh in the presence w- w- access to to wealth but also probably information. And, yes. Yeah, yeah and uh I'll go back to um, what I was saying: negotiating access and institution shopping. Um, I'm borrowing from to- Tobias Haller's work. Um, you know, institution shopping using um, trying to uh, look for different institutions so that in the long run you you're not left without anything, but you're able to access care. That's why we have rich women going to private and public health. Our facilities poor women uh, are likely to go to public and also rely on traditional bath attendants back in the community who uh, they really trust that can do a good work this is an this is actually a fascinating concept institution shopping because oh, yeah. then it actually opens up the idea that that birthing itself is not just medicalized but mm-hmm. also commodified uh, that you can shop for the services that you want you can shop for information or you can't um Yes, and you you can shop, and uh, in in the institutional shopping, we have what we call bargaining power now. Yeah. It is commodified, yes, the way you say. But now, who has more bargaining power? Definitely, this is uh, women who are socioeconomically well off. Yeah. Yes, and they are likely to shop around either go to private health facility, public health facility, private consultant, gynecologist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes. Can I ask you? Um, to map out for us especially through your project but i think that what you describe here for for kenya mm-hmm. is again quite applicable uh, across the globe what is the institutional framework around birthing so there are state initiatives to as you already mentioned to to for social protection mm-hmm. that might or might not work mm-hmm. uh, in different mm-hmm. contexts mm-hmm. Um, are there ngos who are at- attending to these same issues and where do these bigger uh, transnational institutions like uh, well health organization uh, fit in this kind of landscape oh yeah <laughs> Thank you so much, George. Uh, the thing is, um, government of Kenya receives funding from uh, World Health Organization. Some NGOs I know of receive funding from World Health Organization. And the, the thing is, uh, bottom line is to attain the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we are talking about Sustainable Development Goal number three and universal health coverage aspect of it. So then when this funding are given out then it is upon the government to initiate the programs. So it's kind of um top down approach and people are not consulted. So so th- th- that's why you you find that despite the fact we have campaigns for uh, mothers to give birth in health facilities we still have mothers who give birth at home. We still mm-hmm. have mothers who face uh, have complications and along the way they, they, there is maternal death. So 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 um The, the the world health organization and many other international organization go through the government and ngos and it's kind of top down approach i i i really look forward to um 
having a um, bottom up approach where we ask the community what they feel they really need in terms of birth and maternal healthcare interventions and then from we work from the community going up i think we can achieve uh, the desired results in terms of lowering maternal death in kenya and maybe in other contexts also and then to come back uh, for full circle to what in your writing you call cultural practices mm-hmm. i mean mm-hmm. more specifically the kind of um not necess- but of course biomedicine is also culture but the kind of practices that are um, effaced by biomedical interventions and i i just remember the uh, short anecdote um in northern kenya mm-hmm. somewhere around maralal at mm-hmm. some point precisely because around struggles as, around the same issues that you describe there was an attempt to create a uh, so-called manyata maternity where um you create uh, manyata is the traditional homestead mm. you create a, a, a traditional homestead so women from rural areas feel more welcome it's not the the, the kind of scary medical building of a hospital mm-hmm. let's say mm-hmm. but it's something more appealing and yet it didn't work mm. because the manyata itself relates to notions of kinship to mm. whose life force is mm. there uh, where do you bury the placenta which is something that you describe in your work as well mm. Um so how do you how do you how actually how do the women you've worked with see this tension then Yes that's a very important uh concept um right now what i know um when i left kilifi we had uh, maternal health sheds these are built in the hospital but i'm still going back to what i refer to as fox taxonomies people have their own narrations to what birth means and birthing process itself so when you trying to detach people from uh, their community and you want to, you want them to to be in the hospital for that period waiting to give birth it's it's becoming a very big challenge and again i remember there is issue of kinship when you remove uh, when you direct mother from community to the hospital you know there is kinship tie which is broken here there is things that community believe in and mother in law has an a say in this in terms of where will you give birth in terms of when this is my first grandson where will we take the placenta you know socio cultural issues when we try to separate socio cultural issues from the community to the hospital without actually consulting the community then it becomes a, a bit problematic again because yeah. now people will yeah. resist going to these sheds that's why you you see the manyatas people don't go because now if you don't really engage them from the word go then it becomes very difficult for them yes yeah no it's interesting because then the the assumption also is that um it is the mother as a sort of autonomous individual who makes a choice or as what you're describing here or what your interlocutors are describing mm-hmm. is a more complex network of obligations mm-hmm. of expectations um in which in which this sort of decisions are negotiated or or debated oh yeah uh, and uh, i you know decision making is uh, something key in uh, maternal health care access and bathing when a mother gets expectant i'm talking from kilifi county perspective and the griyama community you know if at all this is the first child then it means mother in law sister in laws even the husband has more say than the mother so so mother is like a, a like a vessel to 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 give life but uh, it's yeah, the, the mother herself doesn't have voice in all yeah. this so so you the mother the mother is used as a vessel then uh, decisions on where to give birth uh, naming and all these social cultural issues are left to the kings so we, the mother becomes a vessel for the lineage's oh, reproduction yeah, in yeah, a way yeah yeah, yeah 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 and then i wonder if the work that uh this multiple actors you're describing do on birthing align with other sort of um ngo work like ngos for example mm-hmm. on women's empowerment mm-hmm. um, um kind of microfinance projects mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. that seek to give women autonomy in rural areas and mm-hmm. so on mm-hmm. um do you see this as overlapping yes the uh, i can say there is a bit of overlap because again the um women who are very poor there is an aspect of t- trying to sensitize them and empower them 
and uh, th- this is where women are encouraged to join uh, the uh, local rotating credit associations women join um, women groups and in the long run they get something you know um, we call it individual birth planning scheme so so that when birth uh, when complication arises when they're expectant they know where to go to they negotiate um access and they have alternatives to 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 seeking care other than relying on traditional birth attendant or public health facility then women can now make a choice because at least economically they are a bit empowered so th- there is aspect of trying to empower this woman who is um very poor in the community but is i, I feel it's a, at a nascent stage uh, because not all women are reached anyway yeah but mm. you, so you call them uh, individual birth giving schemes yes individual birth birth plans plans yes what are they actually uh women are encouraged to to prepare themselves uh in case of eventuality so when they go for mat- uh, uh, antenatal um uh, care you know they 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 are, they are prepared psychologically that you know you need to to prepare you need to keep a b c d so that in case of emergency you know what to do yes so they are prepared okay. in advance so it's an education oh, initiative oh education no, initiative no, yes no. Uh, especially by the health, pro- health providers let me ask you now what do you then think after having done this research for for all these years um do birth and birthing processes mean in terms of global uh, a global agenda for for change health um care i love the word global agenda because now we have the global debate on universal health coverage and um we will only have universal health coverage when we try to consult the community when we want, when we try to give the community um the voice to um rise up and say what they feel they really need in terms of uh, birth and maternal health care because where do we put uh, these social institutions in the community traditional birth attendants or midwives they, they are very mm-hmm. important people mm-hmm. how do we integrate them in the mainstream if at all we integrate them in the mainstream and give them some kind of training then i, I feel um and also with technological advancement in maternal health uh, i feel um uh, maternal mortality um will be um something to forget and we we will be able to uh, achieve universal um i mean uh, social uh, sdg number 3 Uh, sustainable development goal number three, uh, where we we are advocating for uh, health and well-being for for all populations. But, but uh, I I will repeat that unless we look for a way of uh, um, integrating the, these social institutions, which are very important in the community in the mainstream, then um the the war and fight for maternal mortality is still far but but again i believe in terms of technological advancement and inclusion of these traditional midwives then i believe we, we will be able to win this war and yeah, then the the idea of empowering midwives also is an idea of for for grounding forms of knowledge oh, yeah. that are otherwise not captured by a certain kind of uh, a top down a uh, medical establishment mm-hmm. uh just as a final question yes, uh please. where do then anthropologists come here right? this this idea is 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 fascinating and convincingly uh, worth pursuing um of, of producing and and foregrounding these other forms of knowledge and practice mm-hmm. um that could also um, um expand what you call a, a universal sort of health coverage mm-hmm. where do we come in Thank you. Anthropologists come in because uh, uh, in terms of giving it uh, the cultural lens which is missing from other interventions. When we come up with a program and we miss the social lens of the people uh, because we are so much interested in people's culture, then it it becomes very difficult even to pick up such kind of good interventions like mm-hmm. free maternal health care when when it doesn't sink 
to the people's needs, people's ways of life, people's social institutions, which anthropologists are better placed in terms of explaining, then it becomes problematic. So we, we come in with a cultural lens, trying to interpret what uh, all these policies mean to the people, and then we, we give this to, to policymakers. Uh, Yes, as advice, as guidance. Um, this is this is fascinating, and you give us a lot to to think of and um, to to motivate our work in the future. I do encourage our viewers, if they are interested, to learn more uh, about the topics we discussed uh, today, to check out um, um, Stefan's uh, publication. Um, Stefan, I want to thank you very much for your time and insightful conversation, and look forward to many more similar conversations in the future. Welcome and uh, thank you so much also.